Well, I've invited the drummer to preach today. How often do you go to church and the drummer preaches? But Patrick Hill has been a member. He and his family have been here at Boulder Mountain for two years. Patrick and Jennifer and Haley and Noah, really grateful for this family. Uh, Patrick, I don't know if you know, this is a licensed marriage therapist and has been for many years. He's been working with an organization called Focus on the Family for 22 years. He's been a, a marriage therapist there and really does a lot of work with, with couples in crisis. And uh, he, he can share more about that with you. But Patrick, it's an honor. Thank you for bringing the word this morning. <laughs> Groupies. Well, hey, good morning. Great to be with you. So, so last week, Pastor Kyle brought the first portion of, of Acts in the third chapter, verses 1 through 10, talking about the lame man who sat at the gate of the temple begging for the scraps that people would offer. Couldn't walk. Born that way. We talked about how Peter and John walked into that space. The beggar asked them for something to eat. They said they didn't have any food to give, but they had something much better. Through the power of Jesus, they healed that man that day, and he was jumped up, was leaping, walking around, praising God. The people were in wonder, like, what has happened here? This is amazing. This is where we get to pick up today, friends. God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the story of the gospel. Thank you, God, for the message of the church, the privilege and the honor we get to share the timeless message of the gospel of Jesus. We love you. We praise you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to be talking today, if you haven't picked up on it already, the message of the church, the timeless message of the church, the gospel. After this healing went down, all the people around were cheering and just wondering, what has happened? Peter took that opportunity to share the message. The message is something we get to take with us each and every day, wherever we go, if we know Jesus. The message of the church is timeless. It's something that God put in place since the foundation of the world and carries to us today. There's a term in business and in ministry <clears throat> called mission drift. This is when you make little increments to the message. Before long, you're way over here with the message, and we miss the main point. This is something, friends, we cannot allow in the church. Dave was sharing with me in between services, he's a pilot, and he talked about if you were just one degree off in your trajectory while you're flying a plane, within 60 miles, you'll be a full mile off course. We can't let this happen to the message of the gospel, friends. So the beggar was healed. The people were rejoicing, wondering what has happened. Peter picks up in Acts 3, Verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So when Peter addressed the audience, he knew who he was talking to. The Jewish people knew the story. When Peter said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of your fathers, all the people in that space knew the story because it had been passed down from generation to generation the Jewish people are very careful about the message. Back in the Old Testament, <clears throat> they had this practice of setting up stones, piles of stones or maybe large stones. These were the billboards of the day. I remember Jennifer and I, after we had got married over 30 years ago, we were headed down to South Carolina, 
And if any of you ever made that trip from upstate New York down to South Carolina, as you're in North Carolina getting ready to go to the south, there's all these billboards about this place called South of the Border. A tourist trap, to say the least. But there was a billboard about every 10 yards. So by the time we got there, we had to pull over and go to this place. We've got pictures. We bought a bunch of junk that's probably long since gone. I will never forget the message. Stop at south of the border. Over 30 years now. I'll never forget that place. Joshua set up a standing stone. When the nation of Israel crossed over into the promised land, the land of Canaan, Joshua, before his death, the one who led them into this promised land, took the people aside in this place called Shechem. He wanted to give them a history lesson to remind them of all that they had been through as a people. Forty years in the wilderness, God was able to feed and to clothe them because of their disobedience. He reminded them of all the things that God had seen them through over the years. Reminded them that when we obey God, we will be blessed. When we turn from God, we won't be blessed. After he shared this passage in, in Joshua 24, he says this, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your fathers, those that they serve beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, those that they served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. At that moment, he set up a large stone under an oak tree so that for generations to come, mommies and daddies could be walking their kids while they're taking the goat out for the morning stroll and look at that billboard and say, God did something here. This is part of the story. They could walk through the desert of the nation of Israel and see these piles of rocks and know that there's a story attached there. Throughout the Bible, there are verses that just continue to point us back to God's goodness. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 103, 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. There's a reason I am not God, friends, because I am not slow to anger. If I were God, there would be so many fried fritters on the interstate because my anger would rise up and they would be toast. Thankfully, I am not God. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God spoke into my heart. Jennifer and I did not grow up in a Christian home. We didn't know much or anything about God, frankly. I had lived my life, by and large, filled with anger, emptiness, lack of purpose, lack of vision. I was served in the Navy, which fueled that anger. I got to liken the taste of alcohol, and it took me to a very dark place. Almost killed a lady one night on the way home while I was driving drunk. That didn't stop me. Then I met this young lady, this beautiful young lady, my wife of over 30 years. She fell in love with me so fast. It was amazing. She knew what a catch she had. <laughs> I, tell her, I tell people that, uh, well, I know I have been married happily for over 30 years. Jennifer, she can speak for herself, but I am truly blessed. Yeah. We were sitting at, at home one evening. It was, uh, we got married in July, so Christmas came around, and then Easter. And I thought, hey, we need to know something about Easter. I didn't really know anything about it other than Easter bunny, eggs, chocolate. That's about it. I knew there was a God, always knew there was a God, and that there was a heaven. Of course, my belief system was that I just needed to have the good stuff outweigh the bad. So I would live a life of sin and then spend an entire day 
like waving to people, strangers, helping ladies with their groceries, whatever, trying to do good things to make my heart feel good. All the while I knew I was missing it. Something wasn't right. So we purchased this movie called The Greatest Story Ever Told. Perhaps you know it. It was Back then it was in a two VHS set. <laughs> High tech. We spent three and a half hours <clears throat> watching this film and I was taken aback by the character who played Jesus. I said, that's it. This is what I want. I didn't know what that was. I went back to work the next day. The only Christian I knew on the planet was a man I despised. I thought he was judgmental, always quoting scripture verses to me. I didn't know scripture, so it was, just felt like judgment to me. I went up to this guy whom I hated, and I said, listen, I want to be what you are. Not really knowing what I was saying. So he said to me, let me give you the card for my pastor, and you can call him. Okay. I got home that night. I called this pastor, and I said, listen, I want the Lord in my heart. Again, not really knowing what I was asking. He said, can you come meet with me next Wednesday, a week away? I'm looking back on that now thinking, what if I got hit by a bus? I wouldn't be up here right now. Friends, if someone says to you, I want the Lord in my life, you drop what you're doing, and you tend to that. Good heavens, thankfully, by God's grace, I made it to the, to the office. He shared with me the gospel message. Jennifer was with me. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. I went home that night. I, I knelt at my bed. I received Jesus as my Savior. Complete 180. In fact, Jennifer thought I had lost my mind. I had gone from a sailor by every stretch of the word to this holy man who is now listening to Christian radio, not cussing anymore. And believe me, I know the language of sailor very well. My daughter will highlight that on occasion when something slips out. She is so fast to point out the error of my ways. I can cuss the wallpaper off the wall if I choose to. I had one fellow one time tell me, Hill, do you speak English? There's so many expletives flowing out of my mouth. So I did as any good Christian husband would do. I began to bash Jennifer over the head with the Bible, my heavy leather-bound Bible that weighed more than a small car. She didn't take kindly to that, didn't appreciate it. I've not always been sensitive to the heart of my precious bride. This is our first year of marriage, incidentally. The first Christmas of our marriage, friends, I got her the best gift that you can imagine, a thigh master. Friends, that thigh master never made it out of the box. She didn't appreciate it, didn't like it, and it serves as a reminder to this day that I need to be sensitive to my bride's heart and listen. <laughs> the message of the gospel has not changed, friends. Joshua did not show up in my living room and share with me the gospel. The Holy Spirit spoke to me through a movie led me to someone who shared with me the story. And now for over three decades, I've been able to share the story as well. My bride, my babies, those that I come across. God's desire for us from the beginning was to have relationship with us. And yet, something got in the way. We're going to pick up now in verse 14. Peter says, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. God's desire from the beginning was to have relationship with us, 
his created beings. He stamped on us his image and desires relationship. Sin got in the way of that. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many of you in this room today are included in all? Oh, man. Two hands. Paul says he is the chief of sinners, and I say, oh, no, hold my Dr. Pepper. (laughs) The message of the gospel can be encapsulated in a single verse. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. That very Jesus who walked the earth was mocked, mistreated, scourged, beaten, spit upon, ridiculed, falsely accused, and ultimately killed. We can look back on this today and wonder, what were those people thinking? Boy, if I was there back then, things would have been different. We look at the nation of Israel and we wonder as we read through the Old Testament, what were they thinking? They had the blessing of God and then began to worship a golden calf. Are they stupid? I'd probably been doing the same thing, but it's easy for us to judge while we're on the other side. Do we do the same thing today by how we live our lives? We can come to church and have this experience and put that smile on our face. Have you ever experienced that smile? I'm fine. Everything's fine. All is well. When inside, we're falling to pieces. We leave the church and we go ahead and live the way we want to live. Any of you ever done that? I haven't personally, but I'm just asking (laughs) if maybe you have. Are we settling for the crumbs from the enemy's table? Or are we living and walking in the abundance of Jesus? John 10.10, Jesus says two very distinct things. In the first part of that verse, he says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. The enemy of our souls seeks to steal the innocence of our kids. I'm looking down here at these beautiful teenage people. The enemy of our soul wants to rob you of the joy that can only be found in Jesus. He wants to destroy marriages and families. The very picture of the relationship between the bridegroom, Christ, and the bride, the church. He wants to rip apart families. In my role as a therapist, I see it all the time over and over and over again. When people have lost the sight of Christ, they go down roads that they never had planned on going. The enemy will pull you in, seduce you, and rob you of joy, peace, happiness, contentment. Isn't that what we see in the world today? Watch the news for three minutes. I can only watch the news on YouTube now because I can only take it in small bites. But can you not see it today, friends? Confusion, anarchy, hate. Every ill that you can imagine is laid out before our very eyes. We see it in this very town today. Jesus offers a different way. The second part of the verse, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 1 Peter 1.8. Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Have any of you ever experienced that? That's the kind of joy that doesn't paste a smile on your face. But if you get a flat tire in your old Volkswagen going down the highway, it's all good. God's got this. It's something that's deep down. That's what Jesus wants to give us. Are you living the abundant life today, friends? Do you know who you are? Do you know your identity in Jesus? Do you know why you're here? Do you know your purpose? What are you here for? Do you have that joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, and are you walking that out? 
in the presence of your family, your friends, those that you have influence with at your job. I had an old friend who, who would talk about this idea that as, as husbands, I could quickly say I would die for my wife and for my kids without question. Take a bullet for them in a heartbeat. No question. But he would flip that around on me. He says, but are you willing to live for them? I can say I would die for Jesus, but am I willing to live for him? Or am I just going to go with the culture, go with my friends, go with the flow, because I don't want to be called out as some kind of religious fruitcake? I'm at the point in my life where I really don't care, so it's good for me, but maybe some of you struggle with that a little bit. God designed us for relationship. Sin got in the way, and yet God still pursues. Peter picks up again in verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaim these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The gospel message has not changed, friends. God has desired relationship with us. Sin got in the way of that relationship, and yet he still pursues us as the hound of heaven. He does not stop. 24-7, our Father pursues us. But the door that he wants to open, the door to our heart, doesn't have a knob on his side. That knob is on our side. It's up to us to open that and let him in. All he asks for is our heart. We don't have to clean up to come to Jesus. Praise God. God pursued Gary. <clears throat> One night I was coming home. This is years ago. I was out running. I used to run every day, about four miles. I wasn't being chased. <laughs> there, there were at times when I had this, this idea that when I get home from this run, I'm going to have chicken wings, so that served as a great motivation for me. I was coming home late. It's about 9.30 at night, and I'm, I'm just a few houses down and I had my Walkman at my side. Any of you remember Walkman? Yeah. Little cassette. It was a beautiful thing. I love my Walkman. And all of a sudden, this creature came out from behind a fence. The head as big as a Tyrannosaurus Rex. The head gets larger every time I tell the story. <laughs> this thing came down to right to here by my ankle and was looking up at me like I was a pork chop just slathered in butter. There was just spit coming down off of this dog's jowls, and he was hungry. He was hungry, friends. He was hungry for me. I could see it in his eyes. I was like a bucket of chicken to this dog. He began barking at me, and in that moment, <clears throat> what invoked in me was the voice of a thousand toddlers, and I screamed as loud as I could. <laughs> I didn't see a stick, didn't see a gun. No bazooka, no flamethrower, no rocks, no nothing. All I had was my Walkman, and I wasn't going to part with that cherished possession and throw it at this stupid dog. So then, all of a sudden, out of the wilderness, I heard a voice. It was actually a couple houses down. This guy was calling, saying, don't worry, mister. My dog won't bite you. And in that moment, that dog latched onto my ankle like it was a soup bone. I screamed so loud. There's windows cracking all over the neighborhood. This guy came up and said, oh, no. I wanted to pick up that dog, friends, and beat that guy to death with that dog. I was so angry. Somehow I found up the wherewithal to say, can you find the paperwork? Has this thing been given its shots? The last thing I wanted was rabies. He comes out with the paperwork, and then he began to, to say, I cannot believe this has happened. 
my wife has left me. I'm on disability. My car won't start. I thought I was listening to a country song, my friends. While I'm standing there bleeding to death, maybe, well, sort of to death-ish, it hurt. <laughs> this guy is telling me his, his sob story. <clears throat> I still wanted to beat him with his dog. I looked up at the expanse above me, Pikes Peak. We were in Colorado Springs at the time. This beautiful mountain scene with the moon shining, the stars glowing, and I was reminded of something. I came out to Colorado to go to Bible college, had the call to preach. I'm a Christian. I have the message of the gospel in my heart. Beating this guy with his dog is not the appropriate option here. So I instead summoned up the courage the Holy Spirit actually spoke through me. And I said, I heard, I heard this guy's name. I actually read it on the paperwork. His name's Gary. His dog's name, funny enough, is Booger. <laughs> Friends, if you know me well enough, you know that I find funniness in boogers and whatnot. I have a very junior high sense of humor, so that was very ironic that I got bit by a booger. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so I said, Gary, has anyone ever told you about Jesus? I'm standing there. My shoe is filling with blood. My sock is soaked with blood. I know I've got to go to the emergency room. I stood there, and I shared the gospel with Gary. Never saw him again. I don't know what happened to Gary. But I do know that night he heard the message of the gospel. Jesus, when he hung on the cross, also bleeding, way worse than I was. He summoned up the strength to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The thief on the cross was saying to him, why don't you just call down the angels and zap these fools? You're supposed to be God. Get us out of here. Show these guys. And then the other thief spoke up and said, listen, we're up here because we deserve it. He's done nothing wrong. He turned to Jesus and he said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? And Jesus told him, I'll tell you this day, you're going to be with me in paradise. The message of the gospel has not changed, friends, since day one. God created us on purpose, for purpose, created us for relationship. Sin got in the way of that. And God continues to offer us a way back to him. This is the message of the church. This is the message we have been honored and privileged to share with others. We can't detract from the light or, or from the left. We absolutely must share the gospel in every opportunity God gives to us. First, we've got to know it ourselves, friends. We've got to be about the mission, about the message. So what part are you playing today? Are you living the message? Are you living out of an abundance in Christ? Or are you settling today for the scraps from the enemy's table? You get to make the choice of how you want to design your life. Don't leave these doors today until you've made a commitment to that, my friends. Let's pray. God, I love you. Thank you for the message of the gospel, the timeless message of the gospel that we get the privilege of proclaiming here at Boulder Mountain through things like live nativity, through communion, through opportunities to connect at a local farm with kids. God, we get opportunities day in and day out to share the message. Help us to be faithful and true. It's a simple message and one that brings you glory and honor and saves the hearts of those people that you came and died for. We love you, God, and we give our hearts completely to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. 
Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.